All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, a concept in um, complexity of training and test in, in machine learning models as dichotomy. And also, uh, that's going to be the principle of going towards uh, VC dimension. So that's standing for VCD here. So with, as we talked about previously, the the recent models are getting more complex. So if you take a look at this, this graph, the more you go on the right, the model comp uh, complexity increases. So it's starting from a very simple linear model. And then the, the second order models, which contains a higher order of polynomials, and also towards neural network, the complexity increases. Thus, we started to have a decrease in the training error, or e e in. And we started also from underfeeding towards overfeeding because they are um, they can adapt themselves towards their training set. But on the other hand, the test case because we kept uh, you know including more complex and more variety of test sets, the e out increased on the other side as well. So it's always a, a trade off to to find the right model given a problem, right? So on the, the left side, you're going to start with overfitting, and on the right side, you're going to go for overfitting. So you have to find a way in order to balance which model you use for which problem, and to what extent you want to do the training and testing phase, right? All right, so, so last session we, we talked, the last three lectures actually, we talked about pack learning. And so let's just have a recap of what we've been, think, uh, what we've been talking about. So we, we talked about how we're going to define E in of the candidate hypothesis, or E in of G, and E out of G, as for the first one, it's going to be the, the summation of all cases that we had the misprediction, the the misprediction in the training examples. So from, from the marble of beans, you have, you have all your x's, the capital X. You make a sample as your small x, right? You have like, and then you predict and you check the, the prediction, right? So this will generate your E in, and this will generate your E out. And we talked about these two cases, E in and E out. So E in was, because we had a sample, we, we knew how to count them, because they were countable. That's why we, the N was known to us. But on the case of the test set, we had to start um, calculating the probabilities of the misprediction because we don't know the, the number of the capital X yet, right? Okay. And then we define generalization error as the, the difference between your E in and E out, both of them on the G case, and we call it as delta G. And we mentioned that for the hypothesis set of H, including all those 
H1 up to Hm, so we had M of those. And the case that M was finite, so it wasn't an infinite M, we could have had the bound, we could have added the M here to the Höfting's uh, inequality, and this will give us a, uh, a complexity, an upper bound for the complexity of the, the model we have to tackle. But in many cases, we saw that this m could go on to be an infinite value, even for the case of perceptron. Um, so for the case that m was infinite, this inequality was not, but it couldn't be generalized, and it was a weak inequality. So in this, in this lecture, we want to find out how we're going to replace m with another value that represents a better upper bound for us. Because if you recall, like for the case that here you had pluses and here you had minuses, so we could have m of these perceptrons, right, that does the job perfectly. And many of them had overlaps, like when you have these two perceptrons, they are overlapping most of the cases, still they are doing the right job, right? So the number of these, if you count them, like one, two, three, four, so they, they could be infinite. So this doesn't give us sometimes, for the case that m is infinite, a nice upper bound. So in this lecture, we're gonna learn how we're gonna uh, set a cap, a better cap for our upper bound of the, the complexity of the model. Right? Alright, so, so as I mentioned, we have when we have m as infinite, the approach with the union bound does not generalize. Thus union bound was a case that we were adding the probabilities, right? The h1 plus h2, all of them. And we would put them With the first, with the value multiply m, this one is only tied if the events are exclusive, right? But we see that there are multiple cases that they are not. So suppose you have a hypothesis in, in, in 2D that you have to, in a circular shape, right? This is your h1. And you have another hypothesis like this. And another one, S3, right? And there are a bunch of pluses, and there are minuses, right? So you see the majority of the area that each of these hypotheses are covering are overlapping with each other, right? So if simply I add the area, I sum up over the area of H1, H2, and H3, I am basically wasting a lot of unnecessary space as a higher upper bound, right? Whereas the actual these joint values were not that much, right? They were like here. So it was mostly just like one hypothesis. But now I'm adding three more. That's why union bound is tight only if the events are exclusive. If they have way too much overlap, or if m, if the number of hypotheses are infinite, which is on the case of one, the Huffington inequality does not give us a, a, a reasonably established upper bound for the complexity of the model. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. So how we can change 
union bound is M with a more representative uh, upper bound. Okay. All right. So let's see another example, just like the um, the one that I mentioned in the previous slide. So in this case, so we have we have pluses here. So one set of data, we have minuses here, right? And you have your hypothesis, which was a, a perceptron, H1, right? And this will classify on the right side the pluses and minuses. In this case, that is, is correct. On the given samples, like you have, you have a plus here, and you have minus here, right? In this case, your E in was zero, right? The training was okay. But how about the testing, right? The E out. On E out, this, the whole right side was the pluses, right? The whole section on the right side. So here are pluses. But your perceptron classifies them at minuses, right? So this shaded, this crisscross uh, blue region would be the, the cases that you have missed prediction. That's why for E out of H1, you're gonna have the probability of falling in this blue region, right? And this probability is actually very large, right? Thus, we can, we can say that the data, the data set that we're working on, this data, was, sort of, was bad for our hypothesis. It wasn't representative enough of our hypothesis because the hypothesis wasn't seeing the data before classifying it, right? We can also say that D is also bad for many other hypotheses as well. So suppose if you go from H1 and you build another hypothesis, H2, we're gonna have the same issue here as well. It's gonna be also bad for H2 because you're gonna have also a shaded area here as a misprediction, right, for E out. And this is because for the case that the hypothesis cannot see the data before they do the classification, right? Is it clear? All right, so so the key idea is if you, if you make a union bound out of these two hypotheses, it doesn't take into account a right set of counting for our upper bound. So also consider this, this case that you have your delta G, right? should be equal or greater than a small value called epsilon. So this will expand to the difference between E in and E out. And then E in would be this value and E out would be this value, right? However, your hypothesis, which was a function, depends only depends only on your data, right? X1 up to Xn. Right? Your hypothesis was only dependent on your data, which was from 1 to n. But the issue was, when we were making the union bound, we were counting the number of hypotheses from 1 to m, right? So we see that this m, in many cases, just like we saw here in the previous slide, is not representative enough of a good higher bound. And we need to change this to relate to this n that our hypothesis, just like the, the previous case, are depending on, because these are the data that they need to classify, right? 
So we have to find a way to extract a value from n and replace it with m for this matter. We'll just clear this. And that's, we're gonna, that's, uh, that's what we're going to talk today. So effective number of hypotheses on a, sample, on a sample of size n, we define it as this value, m of h of n. So I'll, I'll, I'll describe this shortly. So we want to find a way to define an effective number that are uh, related to the number of data samples in your X. All right. And then there's this notion called dichotomy or duality on, on the case of a binary classification that we're going to discuss today. So, so what is a dichotomy? So assume you have n data points in R space, right? So x1 up to xn, and they are fixed point, right? You have R space, let's say n, n as 3. x1, x2, x3, right? And let us assume that we have some hypothesis edge from the from the set of hypotheses H, uh, capital H, so that they do some classification, right? From this R space, they're going to input, and they're going to output plus or minus 1, right? So they're going to say that this is either plus 1 or minus 1, this is either plus 1 or minus 1, and x2 is either plus 1 or minus 1, right? So. Thus, we see that the hypothesis is here for our x's, in this case x n was 3, also does the same, right? They're going to transform your x, which was the R space, to the minus and plus 1 of the order n, in this case was 3, right? We had And this is going to be the evaluation of your hypothesis given this data, right? Okay. So in a sense, your hypothesis set, when given this data x from 1 up to n, should, it be, should be able to do only this, right, given those n's. And as a definition for a dichotomy, we define it as the collection of all binary vectors generated by H over our data set. So in this case, we have three, three values. So this one could be plus 1 or minus 1, right? So x1 could be plus 1, could be minus 1. x2 plus 1, minus 1. x3 plus 1, minus 1. 
And this duality, this this dichotomy, this because it's, it's a binary classification, is called dichotomy, right? So now we have to see how many combination of these values, right? This could be one combination. This could be one. This could be one. That our hypothesis said should cover, right? Because what if I put my H1 here, right? And, and we consider the first case. X1 was plus 1. X, X2 was plus 1. X3 was plus 1, right? What if I put my hypothesis here on the same case or on the second case? or on one of the cases that this is plus one or minus one. So how many different variation I'll have given this dichotomy, given this binary value that each of those data points can get, right? And we have to find a way to find an upper bound for the number of times we can vary this, this scenario given the binary value that our data set can take, right? And this is actually the definition of dichotomy. So we want to find a way to find that number that defines the overall number of times that my hypothesis can classify this space. I'll give you an example in the next slide. All right, so as a, as a visualization example, so say you, have, say you have this value on the upper left side, right? So you have six points. They don't have any color because we haven't classified them, right? But they, they can have two values, plus one or minus one. In this case, blue and green, right? So. so just think about it as if I have a, uh, a piece of paper. It's a, it's a flake paper, so you can see inside. And given this, the position of each of the x's, I'm putting holes in my piece of paper to match that, right? So I put a piece of paper here on top of them. I just put some holes on the position of the data, right? I don't see the rest of the, the data space. I'm just seeing some holes that represent these values, right? Let's put them on top of the holes. OK? Now, given the dual value that each of the points can get, this can go either green or blue. This can go either green, green or blue. This can go either green or blue. And, and also the same for the rest. How, by the placement, of the hypothesis, right? If I place my edge here, just like what you see in this picture, this tree becomes blue, like this, and this tree becomes red, right? Having the same covered, if I put my hypothesis here, what's gonna happen? I'll generate this. This two becomes red, the four becomes blue, right? And I have a number of other options. I have to consider the dual cases for each of those, right? Either plus one or minus one, right? And this is for all of them. Now I have to find a way, given the number of points, how many different scenarios I'll, I'll have. 
So say you have say you have three points like this. Right? Say your n is three. What do you think the number of dichotomies would be? Start, so let's call this x1, let's call this x2, let's call this x3, right? In one case, I'll consider all x's plus, right? So all cases would be plus one case. If I put, put this here, right? I can put here in the middle of these two. So x1 would be minus, 2 and 3 would be plus, right? I can put this here, x1 and x2 could be minuses, this would be plus. If I put it here, all would become minus. Do I have other, other choices? What if I put here, my edge? This one would be minus, would be plus, right? This represents again this value, right? Can you find another? Another option that represents another dichotomy? Like here? Um, no, only x2, so like, like this? Yeah, so you get like minus plus minus. So I gotta have minus a plus minus. Right. So what else I can get? Can I get more? Since we're, well, since we're counting all positive or all negative, you all, you all, all, all positive and negative, uh, given that the, the classification would be okay, right? So, so say if you have, if you have x1 ma uh, negative, plus 1 positive, and this one negative, yeah, this could be a classification, right? That's correct. Yeah, so you, you, have, three, you have all three positive, you have all three negative, so you can also have that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so we're gonna add, we're gonna add two more points as well. So, that's right. So now you see that now we can cut. No matter how many hypotheses we put here, like we could because this is a continuous space. Instead of this hypothesis, this one, I could have put a million others just next to that, right? That does the same job. But that doesn't change the way that it's going to do the same thing as, for instance, this line, right? So now we know that no matter what the number of hypotheses are, which will then define the capital M for us, now we have a more sensible upper bound that relates to the number of points in a way. So we, we are using N to find a way that value instead of that M, which are number of hypotheses. But because in this case, you're going to virtually have, again, an in infinite number of m just for this because you're going to have a continuous space, right? Okay, now let's see how we're going to find the upper bound for using n as a number of values here, the data points. So, yeah, sort of, yeah, that's right. So, but with some ex uh, exception that we're going to talk about right now. Yeah. So, in this case, we have n equal to 3. And in two dimensions, right? We have 3 input space. x1, x2, and x3. Yeah. So, I, I, I put a piece of black cover. It's, it's plate. I don't see, I don't see uh, the points. I just cover them and put a hole just to see the points and play around with my dichotomy, right? So I punch holes. It's as if I punch a hole on these locations and the rest is covered. So as I sweep all the values, change them to plus one and minus one because of the different hypotheses, I'm going to count the number of times I have this scenario, right? 
some PowerPoints. In this case, even if I put an infinite number of hypotheses in my set, I see that this, the, the upper bound for the number of dichotomy that goes along with my number of three x's cannot, cannot uh, uh, surpass eight, right? It's an upper bound for the number of different scenarios I can generate using these three points. Thus, we call the number of dichotomies, we can see that it's much, much smaller than the number of hypotheses in general. In this case, it was again an infinite number. So this is more meaningful for us to set an upper bound for the complexity of the model, right? All right, so let's see another example. Uh, here. As we mentioned, 2 to the raise of n is the upper bound, but we only call it, we only call it a shattered hypothesis if and only you, you reach to that 2 to the raise of n, which was the upper bound of our dichotomies, right? In the case that for a given number of samples, i to n, if we found that, that the edge of those examples would be equal to 2 to the raise of n, we call it a hypothesis set shatters, right? If not, if it were smaller than this value, we can't say... Uh, the hypothesis that was shattered. So this is just a definition that defines that the we reach the the full boundary of the exponential space that this uh, that this dichotomy could describe. For instance, if you have three points, right, with this setup, so one here, one here, one here, we can say that three points shattered because the number of times you're going to have different dichotomies would be two to the raise of three as you suggested it's going to be eight right but if you have four points with this setup in two cases perceptron cannot be able to this to, to classify this right what are the two cases just like these two if I have if I have this four values here, right? Say this is red and this is red or plus or minus one and these are blue, right? Blue. There's no way I can I can put a put one perceptron to classify these two, right? So this is it's gonna be wrong. Because I have two reds and two blues, so it's it's not a linear uh, it wasn't linearly se separable space. On the other side, that's going to be the same case for this, right? So these two, we have to deduct it from the, the overall number of 4, which was 2 to the raise of 4, which was 16, and now it becomes 14 times for the 4 points. And since 14 is not equal to 16, we say 4 points were not shattered, right? Or 4, uh, or four points impossible, given this this setup. But in this case, given this setup, they are realizing the full potentials of 8, thus we say 3 points shattered.
Let's see a couple of more examples. So we have three, three points. We want to find, and it's a linear classification problem in two, two spa uh, 2D space. And we're using a perceptron, right? So these are, so on two cases we have three points. On the fourth case, on the third case we have, we have four points. So let's talk about the first one. We already, we already mentioned that we have a different variety of classes, which is possible. This is okay. We can we can classify with one perceptron. This is okay. Also up to the eight, which is the number of edges, the number of hypotheses. Number of is eight, so it was equal to two to the raise of three. Thus we say shattered. Fine. We have the same three points in this setup. Can you mention how many, what are the, uh, what are the number of hypotheses we're going to have here in this case as, as, as dichotomy? They are defined in in, uh, in one line. Very lucky. Like so they are three, and they have they 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 they, 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 and they can accept binary values, right? So their upper bound again, just like this, would be eight, right? But there are certain cases because of their, their placement, we can't use one perceptron to classify them, right? Just like the case that, for instance, x2 becomes plus and these two are minuses, right? There's no way with one perceptron we can classify this. Or the other case, these two becomes, this becomes minus and these two become pluses. So you need again two to define them, right? So the number of hypotheses we need in order to classify them is six now. And this is the upper bound, the number of times that we have different scenarios because this wasn't this and also minus plus minus. So these two were another K. So these two are deducted from the eight. All right, so now let's talk about this one, the fourth one. So we have four x's, x1 up to x4. Technically, if, they, if the data set was linearly separable, given that each of them can accept two values, we would have 16 as the number of different dichotomies, right? But because on the case that these two become pluses, and these two are minuses, or the other way, these two become minuses, and these two become pluses, we need more than one hypothesis, because one cannot define that. Thus, it's not shadowed. And the number of hypothesis is 14, right? So 16 minus two, two cases here. Right? Now we can understand a more meaningful upper bound for the complexity of our classification. It's much better than the union bound than in the previous lectures we were talking about using Hefting's inequality. Because in many cases, even for a small, even for a very simple perceptron, m would go to infinity, right? It wasn't a finite number. So the upper one, so the, the difference between your in-sample and out-of-sample error was basically smaller than infinity, a value which is meaningless for us because we already know that it should be. We wanted to have a smaller or more, more meaningful upper bound to, to define our complexity of the model, right? 
And this will give us to define a growth function that we use to set the upper bound. Okay. So now we can define this m of h of n as the maximum number of hypotheses given the, given the uh, dichotomy scenario, right? In the case of 3, we saw that in one case it was um, 8, in one case it was 6. In the case of 4, it could be 16, it could be 14, it could be another. So, for in general, we want to find a general case for that. So for linear classification in 2D space, we're going to have this, m of h of 3 equal to 8, and m of h of 4 equals to 14, right? In general, we want to find the, the higher value. We know that in one case it was 6, but since 8 is always bigger, so we don't care for the 6. So in general, we can say the growth function is going to be always smaller or equal than 2 to the raise of n, right? Now, using this, using the growth function, now we can define a value that we can change with m. And we call that value vc dimension. So vc comes from the, the abbreviation of the, the first, two let, uh, the first uh, letter of the, their authors. So Vapnik and uh, the other author, the Russian author, forgot the name, Chernonenkis. So uh, in 1971, they defined this upper bound. And we're going to talk about it in the next slide. So if you see this inequality, we can define an equal case for that as a breakpoint. So what's the point? So just like k, if k is an integer such that the growth function m of h of k was smaller than 2 to the raise of k, then we can set k as the breakpoint of that hypothesis set, the big set, right? So instead of defining in an inequality case, you can define it as a breakpoint. So if you say k was a breakpoint for that growth function, it's like from after k passing k, that's going to be the upper bound. Because 2 to the raise of k always defines the, the upper bound of the complexity of the model for us. Right? Yeah. And the second last line. Breakpoint? No. Right? What about it? Sharp? I think the end of it, the second answer. Oh, here? We see dimension, yeah. yeah. So this comes from the, the name of the first author, Vapnik, and this one comes from Chernonenkis. Yeah, I'll talk about it in the next slide. Yeah. All right, so now we have a growth function. And using that, we could define a value k for the breakpoint of that growth function. Now let's define the vc dimension, right? So let n be an integer such that the growth function m of h of n is equal to 2 to the raise of n. For the case of 3, for instance, it was 8. And if we add one value to n, this becomes an, an uh, equality, right? For the next n, so like for 3 was 8, for 4, 
is going to be below 16. So we can define that n is the VC dimension of the edge of the big hypothesis, set, our set of hypotheses. Let me define it as this. You're going to see the VC dimension of H is equal to N. All right, so as an, as an example for the linear classification case, the growth function, so for, for our three values, it was eight. For four points, it was 14, right? Thus, for d equal to four, this value would be the breakpoint, thus, the VC dimension is going to be 3, right? Because at 3 is equal, four, at 4 is going to be smaller. Because it was 16, right? This would become 16. Now it's 14. So we say VC dimension of H in this case is equal to 3. And now we have a more meaningful upper bound that we can describe the complexity of the, the models instead of the union bound, right? So just, I'll conclude with my next slide, which are the main results of VC dimension. So, if the hypothesis H, the set of H, has a finite VC dimension, Right, on so that VC dimension is always smaller than infinite, then the growth function is bounded by a polynomial function of n. So at least we have a more meaningful bound for our growth function. So the growth function is always a smaller than or equal than a polynomial function, and this is the k starting from zero up to the VC dimension of H. And these are the number of selection you're going to have, K from N. And this is always smaller than equal to the, the VC dimension of N plus one. Should he, it should be better than plus one would be here, right? So now instead of that m that we were using in the previous lectures, now we use this value. And these two hyperparameters, k1 or k and k2 are defined as fourth, four and one over eight, or k2. This is k2 actually, it should be here. I'll fix this slide when I upload them. So k1 is four, k2 is one eighth. Right? And this can define the upper bound of our function. I'll stop here. We, on the next lecture, we start by recapping VC dimension and we go up to define uh, the variances and, and biases for uh, learning models. Any questions so far? All right, we'll see you guys on the 